Hi, Steve here at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, we're going through 2 Corinthians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we stopped at verse 15 of chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into Your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So we're very thankful for the times that You give us to come together and feast upon Your Word. We are so aware of our limitations and the frailty of the flesh. I just I pray that You would take and filter out all of that which is foolish, seal to our hearts that which is truth, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Open our eyes to see the wonders of Your grace that we may grow in grace and knowledge of You. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I've su suggested to you that in the last couple of chapters we're seeing Paul as an illustration of the Word of God. When he ministered to the believers at Corinth, the Word was not yet complete. We know from Colossians that the Holy Spirit had chosen Paul to complete the Word of God. We know from Timothy that Paul was a prototype of all those who would hereafter believe. Therefore, we see in these chapters the Holy Spirit's using of Paul as the Word of God, and, and we're not uh, in any way attempting to uh, make more out of Paul than we should. We're, we're not trying to make him some hero of the faith, nor to deify him or anything else. He was simply a tool used by God as an illustration of the Word of God and the work at Corinth. We found that the way God used him was dramatically different than the way that a promoter of the faith might function uh, today, and that the things of which Paul could boast were things all which highlighted his weakness not his great abilities, but his weakness. And that shed light and glory on the greatness and the power of God. We got to the 11th verse, and the Holy Spirit has Paul write that he's become foolish. However, the attitude of the believers at Corinth has forced this, uh, for they should have recognized him as God's emissary. And I believe that that verse is fraught with meaning. For those of us who are believers in Christ, that we don't need an apologetic of the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God doesn't need any defense or defending. You know, it has all the marks uh, and the evidences of inspiration. It's a revelation of Almighty God. It stands well and it speaks for itself. And it, and it may well be that the message that's contained in the 11th verse may be one that we hear again and someday soon in an accounting before God Almighty. We should have known, I ought to have been commended by you, and it, and, it, and it seems to me God has every right to expect of us the admission that this is, this is His Word, that it is holy, that it is set apart, that it's inspired, that it's unique, that there's nothing else like it. There are many uh, who claim the label of Christian, you know, who still look at the Bible as, as only some inspired writing similar to that uh, of Shakespeare or, or, or the Quran or the, or the Talmud or any of the other so-called holy books without any apologetic, without any area of boasting or examination of evidence. We should have recognized it as God's Word, and that's the appeal of the eleventh verse. I should have been commended by you. Paul bore all of the earmarks of the suffering of Christ and of the power of God. They should have seen it. We get down to the fifteenth verse and we read, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. I don't believe that's some great commentary on Paul's attitude, uh, nor is it an indication of his greatness, but I believe a message from the Holy Spirit in the heart of Christ. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. That, that seems characteristic of the love of Christ. 
somehow how or or other it seems that we've we have the added well it, it just seems that we have the attitude that uh that you know were we under some constraint of law uh, some system of rules and regulations we we would serve god better that there is just something absolutely against human logic in the course and of the love of god is it, in, is it conceivable that Jesus paid it all? You know, can we take the Word of God at face value? Dearly beloved, you are complete in Christ. If we're complete in Him, what is there left to do? The Lord Jesus Christ declared it is finished and among all of the things He came to do is to demonstrate His love for us. It would appear that one of the outgrowths of the, of the intense love of Almighty God for His own children is an increasing lack of love on their parts. Somehow or, or other, it, it appears superficially as though law and rules and regulations result in greater love. That's... That is not, that's not Paul's, uh, well, that's just not Paul. And the attitude of the chapter changes into a sense of irony. But be it so, I did not burden you. I didn't put any burden on you. I didn't put any burden on you. I spoke a little bit about this in the last video, but not only the burden of financial support, but the burdens of legalism, the burden of responsibility that's always accompanying some kind of, of highly pushed human effort in the name of Christ. But be it so, I wasn't a burden to you. However, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Well, that seems kind of odd that Paul would say that. Now, there's two words there. Take note in, the, in that verse. There's two words, crafty and guile. Those two words are, are used almost, almost exclusively in the Word of God of Satan and his emissaries. In fact, you saw back in chapter 11, I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his craftiness. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. That, that is what Satan does. That's what Satan's emissaries do. Satan's messengers. At least four other times in the Word of God, the Holy Spirit declared that God's Word is proclaimed without guile, that God's messenger, uh, His work is without guile. Uh, fact of the matter is in the second chapter, uh, 1 Thessalonians, Paul makes the claim to the believers at, at Thessalonica that he does not operate in guile. So am I then to conclude that he didn't operate with guile in Thessalonica, but, but he, he did operate with guile in Corinth? You know, would this, would this be the only case in the Word of God where two words which are almost exclusively used to describe Satan's efforts to deceive the family and the household of God, would, would this be the one place where they don't mean that? You know, that, that somehow uh, Paul changed his uh, modus uh, operandi. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced that right. Changed his, his tactics, his, his method of operating there at Corinth. Or is he trying to highlight the foolishness of their conclusions? Okay, so I didn't put any burden on you. I proclaimed grace. I didn't put any burden of financial responsibility or of spiritual responsibility. I, I faithfully proclaimed the Word of God, and I did that because I'm very crafty and I caught you with this. Well, well now it's intuitively obvious he didn't catch them. What he's saying, I believe, to the believers at Corinth is if you think there's something crafty about this, Okay, I used craftiness and, and guile and I caught you. Why do you, use, why, why do you use craftiness and guile to make gain? Well, what gain did Paul make? 
Obviously, he didn't use any, any craftiness in God, but that's, that's where the logic was going. Somehow or other, I, I think there were those at Corinth, false apostles who were using craftiness. You know, I've, I've actually met folks who think they've been tricked by Christianity. Well, Pastor Steve, I heard the Bible say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burdens light. So I came to Christ. I accepted Christ in a, a Billy Graham crusade or, or, you know, or whatever. And, and boy, that's all a lie. The yoke isn't easy. The burden isn't light. Rougher than it's ever been. I've been hooked. You know, and it, and it seems to me that insidiously many Christians feel the same way, but, the, but they would be unwilling to voice it as though there's just something wrong about being the child of a king and operating kind of, you know, like a pauper, knowing a sovereign God who spoke the worlds into existence and, and he can't heal my foot fungus or whatever. You know, I had to pick something there can't overcome some of the difficulties in the ministry. I'm a child of the King, a child of the Sovereign God. Boy, boy, the burden sure seems heavy, Pastor Steve. And somehow or other we've wound up with a, a Christian community that seems starved for miracles. And if they can lay their hand on anything that looks like a miracle, man, they got, they got the radio programs and the, the TV programs, the YouTube channels, and, you know, to promote it. You know, folks, we are just not happy with the Word of God. We want more. And somehow or other, the, the logic of weakness and victory through the power of Christ rather than through the power of man doesn't make any sense to the human mind. You know, we almost, I was going to say willingly, but more than willingly, we almost rejoice in taking a burden that we never have to take. Okay, so I was crafty and I caught you with God. What gain did I make? Did I make a gain of you by any of them that I sent to you? Not only did I not make a gain of you, how about the guys that I sent? Man, I didn't make any gain. How about Titus? How about the, the brother I sent with him? Text doesn't tell us who those were, but I'm not going to waste my time trying to figure it out. But it's an articulated brother as though they well knew who it, who it was. God has not chosen fit to tell us who it was, and there, there's all kinds of guesses. I have no idea who it is, and I see no value in wasting time with it. They knew who, the, who these were. Uh, now, I, I believe, if you're interested, I believe that when Paul went on his missionary journeys, you know, if he couldn't take Barnabas, he took Titus or Mark or somebody, but he didn't make those missionary journeys alone. You know, when Christ sent his disciples out, he sent them out, you know, two by two, and, and there appears to be something in the, the operation, in the plan of God, where we work more effectively together than we work alone. You know, though, though many of us would you know, prefer to be Christian hermits, I didn't make a gain of you, and not only that, the others that I sent your way didn't make a gain of you either. Uh, didn't they operate just like I operated? Well, what was the difference between them and me? Surely the Holy Spirit is not only telling us that Titus and, and whoever this brother was walked in the same spirit, but he's also telling us that as far as Corinth is concerned, there's no difference between Paul and Titus, and, and that ought to go a long way toward us guarding against making more out of Paul than we should. I'm not trying to make less out of Paul than what I should. I see Paul as a sinner saved by grace, one used by God to some degree. You are also being used by God. I believe that God has given you an area of, 
of a functioning responsibility where that you can learn the blessing and the glory of yieldness and surrender where you can come to understand more and more of the grace and the glory of God through the operation of your weakness. And God's strength, just as Paul did. But I don't, I don't see God making some of you, you know, folks out there little gods and, and then making some of you other, others, you know, making some others nothing. Paul pointed out that not only was he nothing, but so were the believers at Corinth. You couldn't charge Paul with craft and guile because the use of craft and guile is gain, dearly beloved. Gain. Now, now, I mean, I suppose somebody could say, well, now, wait a minute, Steve. I, I, I know an exception to that. There was, there was a, this needy family who needed help, but they were too proud to accept help. So we used a little craftiness and we got them some, some help, some financial help, uh, whatever they needed, we got it. And we did it secretly and, and they never knew it came from us. Now, you could give me an illustration like that, but that does not fit this context. What was going on in Corinth were promoters who, though they were using the right cliches and professing to be the ministers of Jesus Christ, they were in fact the ministers of Satan. They were simply made up as actors are made up on a stage. They were made up to look like ministers of Christ. We saw that, it, that in, in the 11th chapter. Their functioning was for gain. You know, somehow there uh, seems to be this deep-seated conviction within Christian hearts that what Satan is doing is he's going around and he's getting Christians to go to hell. You know, I hear that all the time. No, I'm sorry. I don't believe there's a, a shred of evidence in the Word of God that would lead you to believe that Satan has the ability, the craftiness, or any conceivable means at his disposal. Satan has nothing at his disposal that can put a Christian in hell. I not only believe that, I don't believe Satan thinks he could put a Christian in hell. I don't even think Satan wants to put a Christian in hell. You know, all that idea, that's out of Dante's Inferno and some of the early, earlier uh, writings, other writings, that we get the idea that Satan is the, the chief king of hell and he wants to populate it with his own subjects. I mean, well, the, you know, folks, the truth of the matter is that from the Word of God, Satan is the chief victim of hell. He is in no way its ruler. And he is no way he's no way in no way interested in populating it. I mean, what he does want is the production of his own family and household. He certainly wants that. But, you know, and the scriptures call them the children of the devil. But in addition to that, he wants the children of God to deny God His glory, His power, His ability, and in no way anticipating that they would thereby go to hell. One of the ways to do that, of course, is to function in the name of Christ for gain. You know, if somehow I can get you folks to buy redemption, well... Then I've denied the efficacy of the sacrifice of Christ. If somehow I can get you to earn redemption, I've denied the necessity and the, the, the efficacy of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And with all of the ability at Satan's command, there are those convictions arrived at through human reasoning. You know, the uh, somebody says, you know, well, no, I... I I haven't really denied that Christ died to begin the process, but Pastor Steve, I'm, I would never do that, but I have to finish it. And I come up with Satan-inspired verses like, you know, decision determines destiny. Uh, you know, without personal faith, no man can go to heaven. 
you know, as though Jesus Christ did something, but if you and I don't cap it off, what He did is not. And the first epistle to the Corinthians began in chapter 1 that one of the urgencies of this message in these two epistles was not to reduce the work of Christ to zero. You know, and, and if you propose any equation whereby I gain glory, that includes my personal functioning, I have reduced what Christ did to a big fat nothing. You know, you say that's not true, but, but it is. If you say that Christ did 99% of the work, and I only have to do that 1%, you know, if I don't do the 1%, what Christ did was nothing. Nothing. If the Lord Jesus Christ did 99% of the work, and you are uh, to do 1%, and you don't do the 1% you're supposed to do, then what Christ did was nothing. By far and away, the, the supremely important consideration is what I do. But if I believe that I am redeemed by grace, that as I stand and sing, Jesus paid it all, if I, if I really believe that, then there's nothing for me to pay. And Satan's operation is very, very subtle, very, very crafty. Dearly beloved, I don't believe you'd want to take any glory from Christ. Of course, without the sacrifice of Christ, you can't be redeemed. Well, Steve, I know that. Without the sacrifice of Christ, I couldn't be redeemed. But, always, look, always listen for that but. There's going to be a but come along. Okay? But, but you must. And the minute I put the, the you must in there, I've become a burden to you and I can now make gain. That's the way offerings come in. That's the way programs can be pushed to put a burden of responsibility on the Lord's people. In the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the Holy Spirit said, now basically said, now listen, here's the test of the proclamation of the Word of God. It encourages you, it comforts you, it teaches you, but it does not burden you. And if it burdens you, it's not the Word of God. I never burdened you. You, you can say I did that out of craft and guile in order that I might catch you, but, but what gain did I make? Then what gain did my friends make? Nothing. We walked in the same Spirit, and that Spirit was the Spirit of the grace of God, where their weakness was made perfect in Christ's strength. Now, that's surely not the way that modern evangelism promotes it. That isn't the way that we think it ought to be done. That's not the way that we build our, our businesses or, or our personal estates. But it's God's way, and it's a way that describes all, it ascribes all glory to God. All glory, honor, dominion, power to Him. And it's Satan's emissaries that are trying to siphon off some of that glory and some of that power and in doing that, they're demeaning the finished work of Jesus Christ. And personally, folks, I would rather die than do that. Verse 19. You think that we are defending ourselves. My Bible says, uh, 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 again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you. Th this is our old idea of Christian apologetics. You know, I'd like to translate that. You think we're making a defense, but we're speaking before God in Christ. Every, everything that we've done and everything we do is to build you up. Build you up. Not us. I do not, I've said this before, I do not believe that any of Paul's missionary journeys would have been thwarted 
if the funds hadn't come in. I'm going to say that his one great motive was the gain of the Corinthian believers, not the gain of himself nor any of his friends. Without that motive of gain, of personal advance, we're back to the attitude that we saw expressed in the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians that a stewardship, a discipline of the gospel of Christ has been placed upon me so that woe is me if I preach not the gospel. In fact, that's a very strong passage. It, it, if I do this according to my will, then I deserve a, a reward. If I, if I went ahead and decided that I'm going to be God's great evangelist, then I deserve a reward. But if a constraint has been placed upon me, if a dispensation of the gospel has been placed upon me by the sovereign God, so that I can honestly say, woe is me if I preach not the gospel, then it doesn't matter what the believers at Corinth or Galatia or, or Thessalonica or Philippi do. If no funds come in, if no support comes, doesn't make any difference. For there's a dispensation placed upon me, a burden which I cannot reject. I must proclaim good news. And the only reason I, I came to Corinth was to build you up, not tear you down. Everything I've done is to build you up, not, not to increase my pay, not to increase my gain, in, increase my popularity, not to put any burden upon you. It's all been done to build you up. And that brings us to the last two verses of the chapter. 20th and the 21st verses close out the chapter. I'm afraid that when I do come there, you know, I think maybe a word of introduction here is necessary for these last two verses. It's going to be very easy for us to look at the heart and the compassion of Paul and become so impressed with that that we lose sight of the heart and the compassion of God. If we don't keep constantly reminding ourselves, folks, that it is the Holy Spirit that is carrying Paul along to pen these words. What we're reading is the mind and the heart of God. What we're reading is God is saying that they might not be what they ought to be. And not only that, that I'll be found of you such as you would not. Now, maybe my mind wanders too far afield. It's, it often does. But I wonder if the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, if, if He were to walk up to us today, if we'd recognize Him. If He'd be at all what we expect Him to be. Have we so fully made up our minds as to how He looks and how He acts and how He dresses and, you know what he would say that we wouldn't even know him if, he were to, if we were to run into him on the street? I think there is in the verse, first of all, Paul's absence. Paul, Paul hasn't been there for a while. They've not fellowshiped with him. He's, he, he has not fellowshiped with them. That's characteristic of our walk with, with Christ when we're walking outside of grace. There's a reduction in it in an absence of fellowship and uh, communion. There is then the possibility which grows every day as we continue uh, our way in the flesh that we've wandered far afield from the spirit of grace and of love and, and of surrender to the point, uh, well, we just wandered from the power of God. We've wandered from the, the fact that the flesh is weak. I'm afraid when I come, there will be debates. He, now note that he lists eight things. I, I see four sets of two is what I do. I, you can look at all each one as separately, all eight. I'd like to put these together if you don't mind. I have the authorized version here in front of me. Debates and envies, wraths and stripes, backbitings, whisperings, conceit and disorder, so I, I'd like to couple them together and suggest to you that not one of those things can grow out of grace. 
But all of those things grow out of law. Oh, you can say we have debates about the sovereignty of God, the security of the believer. Those are the two, two biggest, the two biggest debates that I'm constantly involved in all the time, seems like. But, but I believe the Greek has coupled them together as four pairs rather than eight individual considerations. Debates and envy don't work under grace. They, they are the inevitable result of legalism, wraths and stripes, uh, uh, debates and envyings are more vocal. Uh, wraths and stripes are more physical. Debates are open. Envyings are internal. Wraths are internal. Uh, stripes are open. Backbitings and whisperings. Uh, bitings are open, open, seems like. Whisperings are internal. You, in light of our being seduced by, by Satan to set up some sort of artificial standard to which we believe every Christian ought to conform, we need to know that these things, folks, are gendered by law. Now, we could say that those are simply the, well, Stu, that's just the old man. That's the, the carnal working of the old man in our moral lives. I mean, we're allowed to do that. But I want to be very careful here, folks, because I believe God has called us to a high moral plane of living and that to the extent that we don't attain to it, we've fallen far short of what God has set out for us. But I believe above that moral plane is also the spiritual plane upon which we walk. You know, there's a great amount of Scripture, in fact, there's a ton of it, that deals with spiritual fornication and spiritual adultery and spiritual immorality. And, and though all of these things may well be outbreaks of personal conflict, they are without question inseparably coupled to a legalistic attitude of the Word of God. You know, I, I listen to some of the arguments, uh, some of the preachings, some of the presentation of a merit system and, and I can't imagine that anybody wants to be in that strife over and over again my, my heart cries out where's the peace the joy the rest that is that is ours in Christ where is that in, encouragement and comfort that ought to come in fellowship together then what I, I hear over and over again is my falling far short of the standard that God set for me. Folks, the standard God has set for me is Christ. And He's made me perfect, complete in Christ. The Word tells me that not only has Christ finished that work and rested from His labor, but that I should also enter into the rest of Christ. If I have not entered into that rest, then I'm still roaming, I'm still wandering in, in strife and difficulty, just as the Israelites did in the desert. But, if I can come to realize that God did provide completely for me in Christ, that I am safe and secure in Him, then I slowly grow in the wonder of that grace, and I stand in amazement that people can constantly live in that attitude of strife and envy and debate and concern, you know, picking at one another, trying to live up to a merit system that in no way will gain them glory. It's futile. Where they've fallen far short of the comfort, the joy, the rest that is theirs in Christ. I think the contrast of the 20th verse is, is that I want, I want to come rejoicing. I want to come and rest in peace. And I'm afraid you're not going to be that way. And I won't be that way. And when I get there, God's going to humble me. I'm going to suggest that there is here a word. Of, we're, looking, we're looking at a word of caution in the teaching of the Word of God in, in accruing any personal pride from proclaiming what God has done that's, that's accomplished by the grace of God and not the oratory skills of the messenger. 
that I shall mourn many who have sinned already. That's, that's a perfect tense. They've not repented. They haven't changed their mind about the uncleanness, the fornication which they've committed. Now, I think it'd be foolish to, to suggest to you that there's no moral implication. There's no moral application there. Of course there is, folks. Of course there is. But there's also a spiritual tone. There's both the moral and the spiritual. I think it, sometimes it's possible for us to pursue a, a course of action that we are so persuaded is right you know, we've dreamed about it so much and done it so much. We made it, we made it right in our own heads, you know, in our own minds. We, we're solidly steadfast in our convictions, even if they're wrong. It concerns me that God could suggest there's something in the life of the believer where he's not changed his mind because he or she is, is so certain of his convictions. You know, the psalmist cried out, O Lord, guard me from presumptuous sin. Many of you who know me, you, you know I wouldn't take second place to anybody in, the, in my belief of the sovereignty of God and the grace of God, but I am persuaded more and more every day that God also expects of me a submission to that grace. That's where my responsibility lies. Not, not in any way that I stand in threat of hell, but that I do face a sober accounting before God. And, and I don't believe that's going to be long from now. I believe this is both moral and spiritual, but there are those who, in, in looking at the moral first, who, you know, who are so self-satisfied with their own course of action, that they've rationalized, they've, they've crystallized in their minds ideas which are contrary to what this book says. As, and made it out to be as though it's God's will. And there are those who are so wrapped up in this moral area of, of uncleanness and fornication that they are persuaded that that legalism, that merit system, that merit Proclamation is right. They've never changed their minds about it. And the perfect tense speaks of a settled disposition in that which is contrary to the Word of God. You know, I, I used to believe that no person who was really a Christian would ever continuously function contrary to the Word of God. Yet I'm persuaded that to some degree all of us do. There are errors of the word, of the word that where we're very yielded, very submitted, and there are areas of the Word of God that touch upon things which to us are very, very dear and very right because of our our tradition, our background, our training, our convictions, uh, whatever it might be. Hard to believe this now, but when I began preaching 36 years ago, I was persuaded that anybody that loved the Lord Jesus Christ was always eagerly seeking for truth. And once they found something that they hadn't known before, there would be an immediate submission to that truth whereby there would be a change in, in the life. And I now find in my utter amazement that not only is that not true, but most Christians are unwilling to take the time to study to see whether or not their convictions are true at all. I, you know, it's much easier to say, I know what I believe, and, and that guy, he's teaching heresy, than it is to dig in and find out whether there may be some area in the Word of God that we haven't ourselves properly understood. I get the idea in the perfect tense here that here is an individual settled in his way not only morally, but spiritually convinced that he knows what's right, and yet he's unwilling to make a change of mind, which amounts to repentance. It's the definition of repentance. I hope and pray that that's not true in my life. I'm desperately afraid that it is. I, I try to 
study and be flexible, but as I get older, I get stiffer, more set in my convictions. There's an appeal in the verse that we shouldn't have that, that perfect tense of mind and that to some degree is, well, that is to some extent contrary to a lot of Christian teaching. You know, we ought to be sold on what we believe. Steve, boy, man, we, if, if they, even if they machine gunned us, okay, we wouldn't change. I, I guess to some degree I believe that. As long as you can adequately support what you believe by the Word of God. But if your only support is what you've been taught or what you've been told, it's no better than the, than the vessel that taught it or told it who is just as carnal and fleshly as you are. Surely the 20th and the 21st verses are making a strong appeal for one conforming to the norm of God rather than the norm of the mind. Next Sunday we'll, be, we'll begin looking at the final chapter. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, thanks for watching.